two brothers that are dear to my heart have come. They've just come in, Arthur Burt and Jim Partington. And I've known Arthur uh, just a little longer than I've known Jim. I've known Arthur about 10 years. And I haven't always appreciated everything he's had to say. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I haven't always needed it. <laughs> and so uh, we would like to ask Arthur just to come tonight. Uh, he's from North Wales, formerly from Kent, England. And so, Arthur, if you'd like to come take your liberty. And may the Lord bless you. Well, I thank you for the opportunity of fellowshipping with you, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> I've come a long way to do that. I started off when you were fast asleep in bed. <clears throat> Brother Jim and I left it. What time would it be this morning? Half past five, that would be about half past 11 your time last night. And uh, we've just made it, we've just arrived. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> not only is it a privilege to stand before a company of people, but it's a responsibility. I dare to stand up presuming to be the mouthpiece of God. Did you ever consider that? Trespassing upon your time and God's eternity, it's a privilege, it's a responsibility. God is about to move again. I'd like to read one verse. I think it's Matthew. Matthew chapter 3, verse 10. Just one verse. Matthew chapter 3, verse 10. And now, God has called you and called me to live in a now. We have to live in the is of God. Because God is the great I am. And we are Israelites. <laughs> And now, you see, there's a lot of nows that are all over the place. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. God says, I'll do a new thing now. And the new is related to the now. And the great I am can say to the man who says, who am I? He says, never mind who you are. You go and tell Pharaoh who I am. And tell him, I am that I am. And if there's any argument, I'll give him a demonstration. <laughs> so here we're in the now and it's John the Baptist speaking and he says and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire that's all the axe is laid at the root of the trees. To make a statement that God is about to move again is not a light statement to make. When you put your hand upon the pulse of the world, when you know and when you see God's clock is on the mantelpiece in Jerusalem, and when you appreciate the fact that because you are the children of this generation, you're so close to the wood, you don't see the trees. The miracle of yesterday is the commonplace of today. We live in a world that's aflame with inventions. We crossed the Atlantic in six and a half hours in a huge hotel in the sky. 
that can seat 450 people with a spiral staircase, going up into an executive's lounge, lifts that rise, bringing you hot meals, and the plane doing 650 miles an hour, enough to make Julius Caesar turn over in his grave. <laughs> But, well, we're used to it. It's the commonplace of today. Life is aflame with electronics and computers, satellites and Sputniks. Men, a man like you has put his foot on the moon. A man like you has put his foot on the moon. And our forefathers would have said, well, such a thing is ridiculous. You can't. You, you, you could never do such a thing as that. But it's been done. And who knows what next will be done. My old mother's just been in heaven, what? About three years. And she used to tell me when she saw the first motor car. She died at 92. She saw the first motor car. And believe it or not, a man walked in front of it with a red flag. <clears throat> because it was dangerous. There was never more need for men to walk in front of motor cars with red flags than now. <laughs> you remember the word in the book of Nahum? How else would prophets describe our present day when the chariots would rage in the streets like flaming torches, beaming in the highways? How else would you describe a way back in Nahum's day? How else would you describe so many things? When the prophet, looking away into the future, speaks of the time when Russia will invade Israel on the hills of Judea and flaming hailstones, what a contradiction. But how ominous and how typical of bombs that fall. And we live in a day when men's hearts are failing them for fear, just as Jesus said in Matthew 24. Years ago, I read in a book, 62 million people in America every night pull a drawer out, take out a little box or a little bottle, and they take a tablet to pep them up or to calm them down, to soothe them, to sleep them, or to jeer them or cheer them or do something to them. That's years ago. People are living on the edge of a volcanic crater. Men are teetering and tottering in fear. And any prophet of doom can stand up and depress a company of people in these days when you know by the press of a button you can spark off the next war which can be over in 36 hours and nobody would win it. You are the children of this generation. You have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You didn't ask to be born, you're here. What doest thou here, Elijah? And you and I are faced as never before with tremendous challenges, knowing that your eyes can literally and actually see the coming again of the Son of God. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. What a tremendous privilege. What a tremendous responsibility. Amen. It's yours as part of the mystic body of Christ. Amen. Where do we stand? Where do we go from here? What is our responsibility? Knowing that there is a sentence upon you, if you like, an ominous sentence, certainly a sentence of responsibility, because you are not in any sense ordinary people. Oh, I know you are the sons of God, but there never has been, not even in apostolic days, a people like this, an end time people, who are having to face so many things. What should be our responsibility? Some of you young people, you consider the fact of being parents of young children, bringing them into the world at a time like this. What's the mind of God? What do we do? The calendar tells me it's 1983. I'm not very impressed with the calendar. It's not scriptural. The whim of a Caesar 
set the thing in operation or some pope or somebody. It might be 1983, it might be 1987, it might be 1977. I don't know. And it doesn't concern me too much. I know I will not get the time from the calendar nor from a wristwatch. Simeon came by the Spirit to the temple. Elijah put his face between his knees and he couldn't do that without bowing. And when he bowed, he heard without his ears. Isn't that interesting? He heard without his ears. And he bowed. And he says, there's a sound of abundance of rain. And there wasn't a cloud in the sky. And his servant, typical of sense knowledge, went up and down and up and down and up and down, like a yo-yo. <laughs> and each time he says, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing. But the man of God said, there's a sound. And there's a sound of abundance, of rain. Have you got it? Have you got it? Are you hearing without your ears? Are you seeing without your eyes? Do you realize that God has called you to a life in the Spirit? And that life in the Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, isn't a goal, it's a gate. You plunge in at the baptism and you begin a life in the Spirit. And as many as are led of the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Now then, God requires us to know with a knowledge that does not come from education or, or concentration. You don't get it that way. Revelation doesn't come via education. Neither does revelation come by concentration. But revelation comes as you bow and walk in the light you've got. And as you're having truth, then God gives more truth because the Holy Ghost will guide you into all truth. Experience can never be a final teacher. It's an effective teacher, but never a final teacher. Life is too short to learn all its lessons by experience. Some lessons you can't learn by experience. Jesus says, what has a man profited if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? You can't learn that by experience. It's too late. There must come a time when I graduate from the school of experience and enter into the school of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost will guide me into all truth. But now then, truth demands a reply from my heart. Truth demands a response from me. And the Holy Ghost comes and the axe is laid at the root. Jesus spoke and likened men to fields. And he linked the word field up with the word yield. And the value of the field was from its yield. And he said some yield 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. Here is a company of people tonight who are as varied as primroses or daisies in a field. You're all different. Your potential for God may be the same, but how much you yield as a field is known only to God. But tonight, my brother, my sister, I would be unfaithful to you and unfaithful to God if I didn't bring this truth to you, that God looks for a yield from the field of your life. Some fields are full of stones, and the ground is stony. And whatever the seed that's sown in stony ground, it can never be as profitable and as effective as seed that's sown in good ground. Now, if you've got stones, and your heart is stony, and you've got a hard heart, there are ways and means that God can deal with you to make you more effective as a field that yields some 30-fold, some 60, some 100-fold. We're living in a day, and you may not like now what I'm about to say, but you don't have to believe what I say. Many of you have never seen me before in your lives, and some perhaps hope you never will again. <laughs> <laughs> you are answerable to God, and I declare what I believe, 
but the witness is not upon the lips of a preacher neither by his education or his oratory truth is truth whether you shriek it or squeak it you don't add to it by thumping the desk or shouting or bawling I do all those but it doesn't add to it the Holy Ghost gives a witness outside of the man and that witness isn't upon the lips of the man or a printed page or the keys of a piano or the strings of a guitar that witness is right inside your being he that believeth on the Son hath the witness in himself in himself and so the Holy Ghost will witness to your spirit if I declare truth if there's no witness well all right shoot me down in flames I ought to be glad of that if I'm not declaring truth <coughs> but now this is what I am saying we are now living within the framework of what's called the deliverance movement and all the way through some of you maybe have read the book of Frank Bartleman he was one of the early pioneers from Azusa Street where the Holy Ghost first fell over in California and Frank Bartleman likened the operation or the move of God to an incoming tide and each wave comes sweeping in with a flow and an ebb and 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 if you look back on the history of the church you'll find that as each wave comes in a wave which is a visitation of the Holy Spirit of God that wave witnesses to a specific particular truth men jump on the surfboard of the truth and are automatically carried forward by the impetus of the wave then after the flow comes an ebb and man has never known what to do in the ebbs of God never known what to do in the ebbs of God he always gets restless in a lull but the man who learns to stay still will move quickest when the spirit prompts so man takes his revelation which is his surfboard of truth and after the witness of the spirit which we term a move a revival he takes his revelation and after the flow comes the ebb and he takes his revelation in the flow and turns it into a denomination in the ebb then he's out of the flow the Holy Ghost moves on and he's now stuck with a denomination he builds a wall around his truth and it breeds worms and stinks because God's called him to live in the is he's not prepared to be an Israelite he wants to be a Wasraelite <laughs> and he's left behind left behind because the Holy Ghost moves on and Jesus has declared man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God so he's called to live in the is but now then he takes his revelation turns it into a denomination strangely enough the people who are on the surfboard of the last truth swept forward in the last move turn into the persecutors of the people of the next move that's a sober thought for you and for me are you ready for the next move and how are you going to respond to it Sila <laughs> so if God is about to move again I am not going to be able to grasp in the next move by going back into the last move and judge the next move by the last move and I cannot use my traditions or my convictions on something new I'm like Peter standing in the presence of God and he says when he sees the sheep coming down from heaven and he sees all the beasts there and the voice of God saying rise Peter kill and eat he says not so Lord three words that you can never put together any two but not the three you can say not so or you can say so Lord 
but you can't say not so Lord <laughs> if he's Lord you can't say not so if you want to say not so leave the Lord off <laughs> now Peter was faced with his convictions that came out of a past revelation he says, Lord, you told me not to eat these things. I'm versed in the book of Leviticus and, uh, and all the rest of it, where, you know. He says, uh, not so. And God gives him a living word, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. That's a deadly word for the vegetarians, isn't it? I've, I, I, I've got to be sensitive and open for the next move of God. Whence, whither, what? The axe is laid at the root of the trees. In the deliverance movement, and we thank God for it because we're all part of it and we've paid a price for it. I believe most of us have. I've been turned out and expelled more times than I can remember over the years. I can remember going back to 1934 when I was expelled from uh, the, the movement I was in. I was brought before a board of directors. I was asked, do you believe in speaking with other tongues? I said, yes. Have you spoken with other tongues? I said, yes. Are there any other men afflicted like you in the movement? <laughs> So I was on my way. <laughs> and uh, time's too short to relate the many times we found that with every going there's a leaving. With every going there's a leaving. And you pay the price. I remember the days before the war, brought before three tribunals and then finishing up in prison. Well, it wasn't for a long period, but the quality was there if the quantity wasn't. <laughs> have paid you a price because you can't have truth except you buy it grace is free but you buy truth Proverbs 23 verse 23 buy the truth and sell it not so you know freedom isn't free freedom isn't free that book didn't cost dollars it cost blood and so you too like me you have paid a price. Now, it may not be dollars, it may not be pound notes. Maybe it was in your reputation. Maybe the sword pierced and cleft right in the midst of your family relationships. Some of you, maybe it affected your marriage. Some, it meant broken hearts and broken homes. Jesus declared, I came to bring a sword. There's a price to pay for what? But the deliverance movement can never be final. Now this is where you could fall out with me because maybe you'd feel it is final. But the deliverance movement revolves around man's need rather than God's glory. And God doesn't say, uh, again, you don't have to believe what I'm saying. Test it with the word. What's the witness of the spirit? God doesn't save people to save them. God doesn't heal people to heal them. He doesn't deliver them to deliver them. He doesn't bless them to bless them and he doesn't fill them to fill them. He heals for his glory. He saves for his glory. He delivers for his glory. And he invests in the field that there might be a yield from the field. And I hear Jesus saying, where are the nine? And he looked round, ten lepers healed, one with the healer, nine with the healing. And so many are besieging the balconies of heaven like spoiled children crying to a divine Santa Claus to dispense the confectionery of heaven. Lord, give me this, Lord, give me that, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. As if God is nothing more than a waiter in some heavenly cafe. A waiter, waiter, fill my cup. A waiter, waiter, clean this mess up. A oh, waiter, waiter, another portion. A oh, waiter, waiter, give me another drink. A oh, waiter, waiter. As if the great God of the universe 
I've no more to do than run at my beck and call. Now then, because I believe that the deliverance movement revolves around deliverance, it can never be final. It revolves around man's need instead of God's glory. So I make bold to say God is about to move again. The deliverance movement can never be final. Never be final. And God is looking for a people that will yield even as a field that will yield. The unfruitful tree, he says, Father, spare it. And I'll dig it and dung it. And God digs and dungs. He disturbs and offends. That there shall be an ultimate yield of fruit. And if you are going with God, you'll be disturbed and you'll be offended. There is an offense which is the price. And I would be unfaithful to you if I didn't declare that tonight. And if God is about to move again, he's coming. He's coming for that field to see what its yield is. Now then, the businessman will consider if I invest half a million dollars in that project, what will the returns be? What will the dividends be from the investment? A farmer may have 10 hundredweights of potatoes. He can either eat them or plant them. But if he eats them, that's the end of them. But if he plants them for a future, then they become an investment and he'll have enough to eat and enough to plant because they may make 10 tons of potatoes. Now then, how does God look at my life? Not how do you look at God. You can't live one minute without him. Every gasp of air that goes into your lungs... God isn't a tube of toothpaste that you buy from some shop. Oh, I don't like Ultra Bright. I'll try Close Up. I don't like Close Up. I'll try Colgate. So if he was a tube of toothpaste or something. The great God of the universe does not have a majority. He has a monopoly. In him we live and move and have our being and of him and through him and to him and all things. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. He who has spun galaxies out into space, into an interminable forever that no finite mind can grasp, has carefully, delicately fashioned the miracle of your body. And that house of clay contains a thousand, thousand miracles, which is you. You run away from him. You'll do it on the legs he gave you. <laughs> you'll curse him. You'll do it with the lungs he gave you. And you'll use his air to curse him. Maybe John alike, you'll run to the farthest place. Only to find that salvation of the Lord. And you'll either declare it, prove it, or like Jonah, bewail it. <laughs> because God is God you can't take on the almighty you need it desperate desperate but now then this is not that I'm not saying how much do you need God so much of our lives has been revolving around my need but all oh, to see that God seeks a people who will glorify him. That will bring credit to his holy name. And that they will have a yield from the field, a potential. That there shall be some who will yield, not 30, not even 60, but a hundredfold. Or God grant that even from this meeting, there shall be those who will delight the heart of God. How can I delight the heart of God? Shall I bring him an offering? Shall I bring him oranges from my grove and pluck apples from my orchard? Shall I dig up my potatoes and cane-like bring him an offering from the ground? No. Whatever God demands, God provides. Because it's an issue of glory. And if God demands righteousness, he must provide it. Whatever he demands, he provides. 
because the glory is his. That's why he provided us with a savior. And the glory of God is in the man Christ Jesus. All the purposes of God are locked up, wrapped up in Jesus. And he is the fulfillment of all the purposes of God. And so, now I have to recognize and see that finally the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who the Father delights in. How many of us have wasted years in a lesser revelation, not knowing that the greater includes the lesser? The greater doesn't exclude the lesser, it includes the lesser, but the lesser does not include the greater. Now, if the axe is laid at the root of the tree, or the trees, that's more than just pulling leaves off. It's more than ripping branches off. It's more than sawing the trunk down. The axe is laid at the root the trees. Would you have room for this, what I'm about to say? That this next move will go farther than any other move. And each time there's a move, the emphasis alters. The Holy Ghost alters the emphasis. I mean, if you look back at the history of the church, you'll find that each move, the emphasis was on something different. Obviously, the Baptists emphasized Baptist Baptism by immersion. Well, they only emphasized it because God emphasized it. <coughs> then, uh, uh, you're, uh, I was going to say you remember, but you don't. But you read about the Reformation. <laughs> How a little man called Martin Luther, on his knees at the Scala Sancta at Rome, sought peace with God. Stumbling, blindly seeking through his confusion, and, 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 and his conviction to find a place of peace with God. And like a shaft of lightning, the Spirit of God hit him with one sentence, the just shall live by faith. Now you've rubbed shoulders so long with that that it doesn't mean to you what it meant to a little monk in the Dark Ages. It shattered the world. It shook the world. And as Luther put his thesis nailed it on the church door at Wittenberg and defied the papal bull, it rocked the world and brought about the Reformation. Men died for an open Bible and the truth that you and I so easily accept tonight. Well, then, there have been moves again and again and again and again. The Wesleys, the Wesleys came along. They had a special emphasis. God didn't want the miserable people. The joy of the Lord is his strength. You're not going to please God by coming into a meeting as if, you, uh, uh, as if you're coming to a funeral service with a long, miserable face. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And they began to introduce and bring in, I don't know, I think Charles Wesley wrote 6,000 hymns. Somebody told me that, or I read it somewhere. And soon, the whole church was throbbing with the message of the music that the Wesleys brought. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. My great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King. The triumphs of his grace. The Holy Ghost was emphasizing something new, something fresh in the ears of God. Little men like little Billy Bray way down in Cornwall in England jumped and danced and leapt and shouted round the place. Little Billy Bray used to say, if a lame man at the gate beautiful could leap and jump and dance and shout and praise God because he was healed of his lameness, how much more ought Billy to praise him who was never lame? Amen. He says, put me in a barrel, I shout glory through the bungle. <laughs> and the Wesleys brought joy. If you've ever heard me before, you've heard this. It's one of my favorite stories. It's a little whisker story. I have a lot of whisker stories. The soul have grown whiskers over the years. <clears throat> he was just saved. They gave him a thousand tracts. And the title was Abundant Life. And he stood on the street corner with his bundle of tracts. 
abundant life. There he was, giving them out. A man came up, looked at him, he offered him a tract. The man says, what's this? It's abundant life. <laughs> It's what? <laughs> it's, 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 it's abundant life. <laughs> Have you got it? <laughs> yeah. in doctrine but I tell you this if you've got life it's infectious you can say you've got chicken pox but if it's measles you've got that's what people catch they catch what you've got not what you preach well the Wesleys brought they introduced a, a, a flow of life through song and music but then that's only one facet of your gospel and my gospel because then there were others who saw something else. And there were two men, old William Booth and, 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 and Bramwell Booth. And William Booth, he looked as he saw shivering men in rags sleeping on cardboard under darkened bridges. And motherless children weeping in the rain. And he said, Bramwell, what are we doing about this? Bramwell said, nothing. Nothing? Well, he said, we've got to do something about this. So the Salvation Army was born, born in blood and fire of the Holy Ghost. And the message was what? Soup, soap, and salvation. In that order. <laughs> Don't go to a man who's in rags and starving and say, God loves you. Do something about it. And that was the message of the Salvation Army. Soup, soap, salvation. The Holy Ghost was moving again. It upset a lot of people. Said, Christ the Lord, I will go and see how the men, my brethren, believe in me. Great organs surge through arches dim. Their jubilant floods in praise of him. And in church and palace and judgment hall, he saw his image high over all. But still, wherever his steps they led, the Son of God bent down his head. Then Christ sought out an artisan, a low-browed, stunted, haggard man, and a motherless girl with fingers thin, who pushed from her faintly want and sin. These said he in the midst of them, and as they drew back their garments hem for fear of defilement, Lo, these, said he, are the images you have made of me. Now the army saw that. Today they may have degenerated in many places into an earthly insurance company. But in the early days they were on fire for God. I tell you this in 1933 when I was a young man. That's a long time ago. Yes, it is. Half a century. <clears throat> I was a young man traveling in a railway carriage up in Cumberland, in my own country. And there were two old Salvation Army men in a carriage, in uniform. And they began to reminisce the way all Salvationists do. And they said, young man, do you know, between us, we've done 110 years in the Salvation Army. He says, he's done 53 and the other one, so on. And they began to talk, as old men do, about the good old days. Oh were the days of the glory and the fire and the power. He says, young man, do you realize, did you know what was the origin of the Salvation Army ring? Well, I said, I might, but you tell me. He said, we protected the speaker from flying bottles and rotten fruit and stones and bad eggs. He says, look, I'll show you something. 
and he got a hold of his trouser and he pulled his trouser up and from knee to ankle there was a huge gash of a scar. He says, I got that with a broken bottle when I was preaching Jesus. He says, here, Bill, bend your head down. The other man bent his head down. There was a huge naked scar where no hair grew, right down the back of his head, right to the nape of his neck. He says, how did you get that, Bill? Tell him, tell him, tell him. Go on, tell him. Oh, he said, somebody knifed me. Young man, shall I tell you something? If I could have the glory and the fire of God in my being that I had then, I'd have a scar down the other leg tonight. <laughs> so the army brought another facet, another aspect of this wonderful gospel. Then the turn of the century, as you know, men wandered up to... Sunderland in northeast England and in a bit of a shack of a place called Azusa Street in California with his head hidden in a cardboard box or a number of boxes that made up the platform and the pulpit there were men and sisters there who witnessed the fire of God come down and it burned and burned and burned night and day, night and day, night and day Pentecost had come again. It's the turn of the century. In the country that I live in now, North Wales, right at the back of the mountains, is a place called Bethesda. Just a bit of a village. There was a woman lived opposite the chapel there. And when she heard noise and music and shouts going on at 11.30 at night, she decided that no respectable religious meeting would be going on at that time. Besides, her children couldn't get to sleep. So she sent a complaint to the police station. And the policeman, the police superintendent, only had two policemen. So he sent one of them up to investigate. He didn't come back. <laughs> he sent the other one up to investigate. He didn't come back. So finally he decided he himself would go and investigate. When he got there, one had his hands up to heaven and the other was flat on his face. God was moving. The Spirit of God moved and the flames and the sparks from the Welsh Revival leapt from Evan Roberts across to Azusa Street and, and, and you come to Wales, you'll find all over Wales there are chapels erected in 1904, erected in 1905, erected in 1904, erected in 1906. The fire of God burned and blazed. The miners down in the coal mines had prayer meetings. And the big ponies didn't work because they only knew the language of being kicked and cursed. When the miners prayed, the pit ponies had holidays. God moved. God has always moved. After every flow has been an ebb. And what we now call, I remember the early days, not that that's of any profit to you because most of you don't want to hear about what was, but I just casually mentioned it. The first meeting I ever went into was in 1926 when I was a boy of 14 and um, I, I, I took my father, my father had, was almost blind, I took him up to the meetings of Stephen Jeffries, a simple Welsh miner whom God had mightily anointed, there in the church at Lanethley, a fluorescent lamb appeared above the pulpit and it shone and shone and shone for a solid month, night and day. And when they locked the chapel up and peeped through the people, there was the lamb shining. And after a whole month, Stephen Jeffries accepted it as his commission and he went forth and thousands were healed and thousands were saved. That was only one man, Wigglesworth. I didn't travel with Wigglesworth, but I knew him. I've slept in the same bedroom with him, sat round the table with him many times, seen the power of God and so on. And in those early days, I knew nothing at all of salvation, 1926, it's exactly 50, 50, what is it, 56 years today since God convicted me. And I looked at Jesus on a cross outside a church on a big hoarding, a big poster, and it had underneath, is it nothing to you all ye that pass by? 
And I looked and those words riveted into my heart with the beginning of the work of God in my being. That was Good Friday, 1927. And on the 1st of May, I received Jesus as my Savior. Oh, I thank God for that day. Now, this is what I want to say. I went up to these meetings, the Town Hall, Bishop of Auckland, went up to the Victoria Hall, Sunderland, thousands of people, and I saw them. And I had no background. I had never been brought up in religion or churches or anything. And I saw these people, thousands of them waited to get in when the other thousands came out. And they were, there they were, mounted police controlling the traffic. People pushing them, running shuttle services from the hospitals to the, to, uh, to, to the hall. And God was healing them. And unbelieving believers were running home to fetch clothes for those who had been instantly healed by the power of God. Stacks of crutches and steel cases. God was moving. I didn't understand it. I saw a girl instantly healed of blindness. My mouth opened like a codfish. My heart bumped and thumped like a hammer. And I, I, I thought, oh, oh, God is real. And I looked at these people. They were singing little choruses. Everybody ought to love Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He died upon the tree to rescue you and me. And everybody ought to love Jesus. But they weren't just singing. Oh, no, no, no. They weren't just singing. They were doing all sorts of things. I've never seen anything except in a circus like what they were doing. <laughs> they were singing and they were going, Everybody ought to love Jesus. Oh, they're mad. <laughs> they're mad. <laughs> and then I thought, well, if they're mad, who wants to be sane? <laughs> there was something about them that hit me. A radiance in their faces. Ooh, a perfume that I didn't smell with my nose. A glistening that I didn't catch in my eyes hit my spirit and the Holy Ghost was moving now that's many years ago now there's been another wave which has been called the charismatic movement some people call it the glossolalia it sounds very intellectual <laughs> the first move we had it was called the tongues movement don't go near them they spit on the floor they roll they climb the walls <laughs> and demon possessed <laughs> but now after every wave comes an ebb. After every flow comes an ebb. And I just say this, brothers and sisters, God is about to move again. And there'll be a fresh emphasis. And the proper child again will be born, and as it always happens, the newborn babe is persecuted. Pharaoh determines to slay Moses. Herod determines to slay Jesus. And every time God brings to the birth something new, there's persecution. Bitter persecution. Get ready for it. If you're in the move, you can't avoid it. Persecution is God's income tax. The bigger your income, the bigger your tax. Little income, little tax. Big income, big tax. No income, no tax. <laughs> That's unavoidable. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. God is about to move again. Well, what will the next move entail? Well, I believe God has shown me quite a number of things, but I don't feel that tonight's the time to pass that on. I tell you what I do feel. You can have the bitter, if not the sweet. The axe, the what? The axe, the axe, the axe. Who wants the axe? Oh, well, uh, <clears throat> is that what you've come to tell us? The axe is laid. John the Baptist said the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Now, John the Baptist ministered repentance towards sin. But now this is where you could fall out with me and this is where you 
would not agree with me, maybe. But if it's something new, you must be prepared. That the man who brings something new is either a pioneer or a heretic. And you have to find out which he is. Watch the witness of the spirit. I believe that the next move will not be repentance towards sin. I believe it will be repentance towards pride. Now, test this, what I'm saying. Pride is the father of sin. You can spend all your days dusting cobwebs down instead of catching the spider. Dealing with effects rather than with cause. But pride is the cause. Now, we're living in a day when in the church, if people sin, they lift holy hands up in hell. Not saying that's wrong at all. But here's the tragedy. You hear about Pastor so-and-so? What happened to him? Oh, he got involved with a girl in the choir. Oh, oh brother so-and-so put his hand in the offering bag. Or somebody, something else. And we lift our hands up in holy horror. Not saying that's wrong. But that is a consequence, sin. And pride is the cause. And you know something? Pride is welcomed with open arms. Come in, come in. Preach from our pulpits. Sing in our choirs. Pray in our prayer meetings. Pride has a thousand garbs in its wardrobe. With impeccable manners and immaculate clothes, it can hold a cocktail in an embassy. With polished manners, yes. It can lash its victim upon the floor of a concentration camp till the blood gushes. It has a thousand garbs and can even pose in the clothing of humility. And this is the monster, the treason of the creature against the creator. And I believe God is about to move again. At the time of the ignorance, God winked at. But now commandeth men everywhere to repent because God has appointed a day in which no flesh shall glory in his presence. Now, how do you find pride? Well, if pride is what we say it is, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination in the sight of God. Proverbs 16, verse 5. Oh, well, that's Old Testament. All right, 1 Peter 5, 5. God resisteth the proud. And uh, for the sake of time, we'll leave that. Either the Holy Ghost shows you it, or you haven't seen it, and I can't. I can't impart revelation. Only the Holy Ghost can do that. But pride, in its essence, is the treason of the creature against the Almighty. It would wrest God from his throne and murder him if it could. It hates God. And you know something? At the beginning, pride is blind. You know everybody else's pride, but you don't know your own. Pride is like bad breath. Everybody knows you've got it except you. <laughs> and you open your mouth and offend everybody every time you do. But finally, you can know where your pride is. You can have a mini revival on the way to revival. For yourself, not for your husband, not for your wife, not for somebody sitting next to you, but for you. You can have a do-it-yourself kit now, because you've got to do it yourself. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. You can have a do-it-yourself kit. You know how you'll find your pride? By your judgments. And your judgments will reveal your pride. Romans chapter 2. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest another. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest. Not did do, not will do, but doest the same things. O oh, our lovely David, man after God's own heart, sweet psalmist of Israel. And listen, Nathan tells him about a man who stole a poor man's lamb and slew it for the banquet when he had many of his own. And our lovely David... He says, a man that hath done this thing should surely die. All he done was stole the lamb, and David sentenced him to death. Not knowing that Nathan was about to give him the word of God, thou art the man. You're inexcusable, whosoever you are, the judge. Did you know that what you judge in other people are your own faults? 
That's what Romans 2 is saying. Read it for yourself if you disagree. Bossy people can't stick bossy people. Self-willed people can't stick self-willed people. Mean people hate mean people. Talkers abominate talkers. They want listeners. <laughs> Mommy! Oh, my goodness. Now what's the matter? I said, oh, Willie. Well, what's the matter with Willie? Well, he wants the big piece of cake. Well, all right, let him have it. No, I want it. <laughs> there it is. Tell you something that may make you smile. And as far as I know, we'll finish then. I always watch the preacher who says briefly or finally. Usually goes on 45 <laughs> minutes after that. But um, as far as I know, <clears throat> he was sat down at one of these tea places where you have a, what do you call things? Can't think of the name of it. Um, uh, not an awning, a kind of a big umbrella, you know, outside, sunshade and little tables and they sip coffee or tea or, or iced tea or something and he was there and in England you can buy a box of biscuits now you don't call them biscuits do you, you call them cookies um, milk chocolate biscuits they're made by Cadbury's you buy them in half pound boxes and they're delicious I ought to get a bonus for telling you this shouldn't I um, they're delicious Cadbury's milk chocolate biscuits and uh, you can buy them in a violet-coloured box, and they're very, very nice. Well, he had a box of these biscuits, and he was reading his newspaper outside whilst he sipped his tea. Whilst he's reading his newspaper, at the other side of the table, a Pakistani sat down. We have a lot of them in England, a lot of immigrants. And, uh, and uh, this Pakistani sat down, and he was drinking a cup of tea. And this man's reading his paper when all of a sudden he sees an arm creeping across the table <laughs> towards a packet of Cadbury's chocolate biscuits. And he watches as the fingers pick a biscuit up and eats it. And he glares over the top of his newspaper. Goes on reading takes a drink and then slowly that hand comes creeping out again <laughs> towards the cookies and he pulls his newspaper down and glares at the Pakistani at the other side of the table and the glare was so bad he pulled his hand back see lifted his paper up went on reading slowly that hand comes creeping out <laughs> towards the biscuit so this is too much for him he brings the paper down and he wraps him right across the knuckles. And the poor Pakistani pulls his hand back. And he takes another biscuit. And there he is, munching the biscuit, glaring at the Pakistani. Goes on reading. Then comes the creeping hand again. <laughs> this is too much. Finishes his tea, wraps up his newspaper, glares at the man, grabs the biscuits, and walks away. Shoves them in his pocket. He gets halfway down the street, he feels something at the other side of his overcoat pocket. And he pulls it out. And it's a packet of Cadbury's chocolate biscuits. And he looks. And he thinks, oh my goodness. I, I, I never pulled them out of my pocket at the table. They weren't mine at all. <laughs> stolen the fellow's biscuits. <laughs> and I nearly hit him over the head for eating his own biscuits. <laughs> now there's a classic example of judgment, isn't it? Now, we can smile, but you know, when you open your mouth to laugh, God can pour the castor oil in. <laughs> And once you've seen the truth of judgment, you'll see where the next move of God is going to begin. The axe is laid 
at the root of the trees. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's all stand together. Tonight I, I want to take just a moment again and, and pray along the same line that we prayed last night, except we'll word it this way, concerning the, the Lord's desire to lay the ax at the root. What the Lord has been saying to us is that he's not just dealing with symptoms, he's getting at the root. And for the Lord to get at the root of a problem within our life requires a very unique and distinct permission on our part for the Lord to do that. It requires a very special transaction on our part between ourselves and the Lord. There is a better Bible school than Pinecrest, one that's much better one that's available to you, it's a lot closer to where you live. The only problem is the tuition is a lot higher. It costs more. It costs an awful lot. I'll give you the name of it. <laughs> the address. It's called the School of the Spirit. It's located in the kingdom, the eternal kingdom. The registrar can be found when you kneel alone in sincerity in the presence of the Lord. The registrar will come and enroll you in the school of the Spirit and begin the process of removing things that there might be room for an enlargement within your life. But again, it requires a unique transaction of giving the Lord permission. Permission to invade our life that he can deal with the root issues. For the next visitation, the next visitation will involve the glory of the Lord. The manifestation of the glory of the Lord. And the Lord is looking for vessels through whom he might reveal this glory whereby he might be glorified and not, as has happened in the past, become ashamed. Therefore, this visitation will come upon those that have gone through a process of preparation. And tonight, again, the basis of the word that we've been hearing, just right where you are, we're going to bow our heads and just pray. Ask the Lord about the root that he desires to lay the ax to. Give him permission and invite the Lord into your life. Whatever that means, you know the Lord knows. Hallelujah. Now, Lord, we thank you for your servant, the ministry, the word, your presence, that working of conviction, of your desire for a people, Lord, that will come to righteousness, that will come to the principle of the kingdom, a people, Lord, that will enroll in the school of the Spirit, wherein, Lord, you may work a work deep within that the very rootage of our lives may be changed into your purpose. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, this night, quicken within us even the desire Lord, as our brother Robin ministered last night, if there's something within us that's not willing, Lord, that we can get along with you and speak it out with you in all honesty and then let you lay the ax to that root and sever it. For Lord, we desire your visitation, your presence, your working, your spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You're quickening and you're moving within a people in this day. Now, Lord, as we have bowed our hearts in your very presence, 
Lord, you've recorded within each life the measure wherein you may work and move in the depth of our being. And we thank you, Lord, for this people, for the hunger, the, the desire that's within this meeting toward you, that which you, Lord, seek to accomplish within each and every life. We thank you for the service, for your servant. Lord, they've been up all last night. They've traveled, the change in time and all. We ask for, for our brethren that have come from England a double portion of rest this night, Lord. Hallelujah. Your blessing upon them, Lord, mightily. We thank you for the ministry and the word, the anointing and the spirit. Lord, that in the day to come we may touch you, Lord, as we've never touched you in our life. That we truly may become a people, Lord, of the Spirit. Now, Lord, as we prepare to depart from the meeting, we look to you, Lord, and we thank you for that which you're both saying and doing within us. And, Lord, we thank you for each and every one that has come. And we're believing for changed lives in these days. We thank you, Lord, and we glorify your name through Jesus. Amen and amen. 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 Before we go.